Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, the place where we talk about wealth, success, and the journey it takes to get there, especially through property investment. Joining us today is Tom Corley, my good friend, an international recognized authority on the habits of of wealth creation. Now, he's renowned for his groundbreaking research into the daily activities and characteristics that drive the success of the wealthy. You probably already know that Tom's authored several books, including Rich Habits, a series of books, and the book Together With Me, Rich Habits, Poor Habits. But in today's show, we're going to dive deep into his findings about the seven common money myths. And we're going to discuss what truly sets the rich apart. We're going to talk about the role of opportunity, luck, the importance of resilience, and we're going to be debunking a number of myths. So if you're keen to become wealthy and successful and learn what really goes on, get ready to challenge some of your preconceptions about wealth, success, and the habits that foster them. So let's debunk some myths and cover some truths about the wealthy. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. While rich people only represent a small portion of society, there's no shortage of talk about them. You hear what the rich people are like in the news, on blogs, from your crazy doomsday prepper uncle and so on. There's only one problem with these tidbits and facts. They're in general wrong. Taken at face value, these myths about rich people give you an inaccurate idea of what it takes to be wealthy. So today I'd like to take a look at some of the common myths about people with a lot of money and set the record straight with my good friend, Tom Corley. Now, way back in 2004, Tom started a journey to understand why the rich are rich and why the poor are poor. Through his in-depth study, he not only debunked some common myths about the rich people, but he also gained a profound admiration for them because many of them actually were self-made. And he's written a number of international best-selling books, including our book that I've co-authored with him, Rich Habits, Poor Habits. So let's have a talk about some of these myths. Hi, Tom. Hey, Michael. It's good to talk to you again. Now, Tom, I know that a lot of people listening to this will be familiar with you because they subscribe to your daily blog at richhabits.net, and I'd always recommend people do that, or they've listened to us over the time. But as I said way back a long time ago now, you did that study. What initially motivated you to undertake the research about the financial habits of the rich and the poor? Well, initially, Michael, I thought it was because a small business client of mine in my CPA firm demanded a meeting with me because he needed a line of credit and he was going bankrupt and he, the bank shut down his line of credit and he couldn't pay his payroll that week. And so I thought that was initially the trigger for me doing the study. And in a lot of ways it was, but there really was a subconscious or unconscious element to to what really motivated me, and that was my upbringing. I, you know, we were up until I was about nine or ten. I was we were wealthy. We had money, and uh, my father was a very successful businessman. And then, you know, over the seemingly overnight, but you know, as a kid, everything happens overnight. But it was over a two year period. My dad's, uh, you know, his whole empire came crashing down after his warehouse burned to the ground. So we went became poor not poor, homeless poor. We kept our house and that was not easy. We, you know, we were almost many times kicked out of our homes, but my dad was able to somehow come up with the money to keep us in our home. So this struggle that I went through as a child, it really had a psychological effect on me. Maybe I buried it because I became, I uh, went to college. I, I, you know, I wanted to escape poverty. So I worked as a janitor and went to college while I was a janitor, and then I went, got my CPA, and then I went and I got my master's degree in tax, and I kept going. I had my CFP, all the licenses. I never stopped. So I think the, those things I was doing was really to to escape poverty and, and protect myself from being poor. You know, it was the childhood, my upbringing, that really motivated me to, to engage in this study. Well, to keep me engaged in the study, because it took five years. 
Well, and you're still studying it today. So what you found was that some of the things you thought about wealthy people were wrong, but also they were common myths uh, that the, the public in general have and maybe they're more perpetuated nowadays by social media as well with all the, the pictures of fancy people with their cars and their, their private jets. But I think one of the common habits, a lot of common myths a lot of people have is, is that they think rich people inherited their money. I guess the underlying theme in that, Tom, is they haven't worked for it. Yeah. I, I mean, that's such a cop-out, isn't it, Michael, for people who are poor or stuck in the middle class? It's such a cop out to say uh, rich people are just lucky or they inherited their wealth or things like that. It, it gives you a rationalization, you know, for not being rich. And, and it's, a, it's just a cop out. It stops you in your tracks. So what I found was the opposite of, of what I thought to be the truth was that uh, most of the wealthy, depending on the study, my study said 76 percent of the wealthy created were self-made and other studies have as high as 85 percent are self-made it depends on the study but you know the common thread on, on this is that there are very few that inherit their wealth so the first myth is that the majority of rich are self-made and n haven't inherited their wealth but by the way that's a good thing it means that most of us can be wealthy if we know what to do if we develop rich habits and get rich of some of our poor habits. Now, another thing that we see in the news here a lot, I guess you're probably seeing the same overseas, is the rich and greedy don't pay their fair share of taxes. They say that in some ways about the corporations as well, but let's just talk about people because that's actually not the case, is it? No, and it's not my research. It comes from the Tax Institute. They found that wealthy people on average their tax rate was 9% higher than the middle class. Uh, so they're paying more in tax. Their tax rate's higher. Plus, they're shouldering the burden of taxes uh, over 50%, at least in the United States, over 50% of uh, the taxes that are collected are collected by those in the 1%, the top 1% in our country. That's, that's disproportionate, and that's unfair if you think about it. Uh, you know, one group, one small 1% minority group should not be pulling the wagon for everybody else. Now, there's no doubt that wealthy people understand the rules of tax and have legal ways of minimizing their tax. They are able to run tax deductions if they have a business, but maybe they can write off their car as a business and some travel. And in Australia, we have the concept of negative gearing, where if you're expenses of running your property portfolio or your share portfolio is higher than the income you can write it off against other income. But that doesn't mean that they still don't pay a lot of tax. And I think the other thing that you pointed out was important also, that there's a sliding scale. So the more you earn, the larger percentage of your money you give away to the tax department. So there's myth number two that's been busted, that the rich pay less tax than everyone else. That's a myth that's not true. But I think the other myth that a lot of people carry is the rich are lucky. Again, that's another way of saying, well, it's not my fault that I'm not rich because I haven't been lucky. But we've even talked about it. I guess in some ways the rich are lucky, but it's not the way people think. No, and in fact, I'll go as far as to say this. You will not become wealthy, at least on most of the paths, the four paths to wealth. You won't become wealthy except for the saver investor path if you don't have luck. So luck is, is required for three out of four of the paths. But it's not the luck, the random good luck that just manifests itself like manna from heaven. It's the luck that they create. They create the opportunity for good luck to occur. And they create that opportunity by pursuing dreams and goals and by being persistent in the pursuit of those dreams and goals because they're passionate about it. Like I've been passionate about my writing and and my research, and you know, eventually you get lucky. Even a blind squirrel finds a, a nut every now and again. <laughs> yes. So, so you know, it's it's just staying in the game. That wealthy people, like like uh, I, we were talking about in another podcast, they they are at it for a long time, sometimes into their seventies. And uh, you know, the more you're pursuing wealth, the more time you engage in pursuing wealth, 
the more of uh, opportunity there will be for good luck to manifest itself in life. And, and I'll also say this, lady luck is attracted to persistent people. Uh, so it's like a magnet for, for good luck. So it creates opportunity luck. Well, some people just seem to attract wealth and luck and others don't, but it's not because they're lucky per se, it's because they've done the hard work and the hard yards and they actually know how to take advantage when an opportunity arises. So myth number three, the rich are lucky, well, is not necessarily a myth. It's true to a degree, but it's not the sort of random luck that people are thinking about. The fourth myth that you busted in your article that you write each day on richhabits.net and that, that we're discussing at the moment that you came up with your studies are that the rich are better educated. Now, there's no doubt that where most of the people are listening to this in Australia and in the United States and throughout Europe, a lot of these countries have become knowledge-based countries, uh, that, that, that now we are a knowledge-based society, but that's not the only way to become rich, is it? No, and, and in fact, it's much easier now, today, to become rich because in the past, that knowledge that you were pursuing, you had to go to a university or a college to obtain. Now, all of that knowledge is on the internet. You, you know, I think the, the value of a college education has diminished because of the internet, because the access to knowledge is now not discriminated uh, against against anybody. You can, anyone who has an internet connection can gain access to the knowledge that, you know, 30 years ago, you had to go to college and pay money to acquire. So it's, it's a game changer, the internet. And I, and I think that there's uh, four paths to wealth, as I mentioned. The, the saver investor path is the one path where you don't need a college education. You don't. You you can be a plumber. You can be an electrician. You can have a skill. You can be an employee, and as long as you save and prudently invest consistently, you can become a millionaire. It takes longer than the other paths, but uh, that path is available to anyone with who you don't need a college degree. Now, another myth that the poor people keep perpetuating is that the rich people aren't charitable. Now, I know from personal experience, and I know you do as well, that that's not the case. I know you do a lot of charity work. We are running another charity ball this year. Pam and our Brisbane office are running a charity ball for a hospice for a terminal children called Hummingbird House. We've done that. This is the fourth charity ball we're running. I know that you spend a lot of time as well, but it's not just you and me. I know in your study you found that wealthy people contribute a lot more. They contribute their time and their money. And there's, I have numerous studies on the money part, and I have studies on the time part. But one of the interesting things I found in my, my research was that a lot of the self-made millionaires, a lot of the wealthy, didn't have to be self-made, any of the wealthy, a lot of them were on uh, boards or committees of nonprofit, typically local community-based nonprofits. Sometimes they were, you know, uh, regional or national nonprofits, but for the most part, they were local community-based nonprofits. The most successful people in the community were on the boards. And uh, that was an eye-opener for me because I said, wow, imagine a lot of people say, well, you know, most of us come from poverty or the middle class. We don't know a lot of rich people. Well, this is a this is a quick uh, solution to that problem. Just join a nonprofit, a local community based nonprofit. Guess who's going to be on the board of directors of that nonprofit? A lot of wealthy people. And you're going to meet these wealthy people. You're going to build relationships with them. So, yeah, the wealthy people are charitable. They want to give back. Uh, they understand. I don't want to say it's karma because I don't really believe that that applies here. But I think it's a service to others mindset versus service to self. I think a lot of wealthy people have this service to others mindset. And that's why they try and exceed expectations for others and, and add value to their lives. And by doing so, they get paid more money. Now, one of the other myths that you read a lot about is that money doesn't 
by happiness. And now, if your expectations grow faster than your income, you're never going to be happy, and we see that uh, with a lot of people. But I know both you and I have written that any problem that money can solve isn't really a problem, is it? Yeah, and so this is really cool, this research here, because the answer is yes, money does not buy happiness. But what money does buy is the removal of unhappiness. And in my study, when you were financially secure or wealthy, uh, you eliminated about 56% of the unhappiness events that the average person has to contend with. Your boiler breaks, and now you've got to spend $5,000 to get a new boiler or $2,500 to get it fixed. Well, if you're poor, that's a big problem. That's a problem that sits with you for months. You get somebody you know to fix it. It's a Band-Aid. It never really gets fixed. And uh, you always have anxiety over, especially during the winter when the boiler goes down. Same thing with the air conditioner. You have a hole in your roof. You can't fix it right away. Uh, you don't have the money. Well, rich people, the only problem that rich people experience when something goes wrong is how quickly they can get to the phone, right? Because they can solve their problem with a phone call. Uh, they don't have to worry about money. So it eliminates the unhappiness, the stress, the anxiety, the worry that's associated with when things go wrong in life. Now, I know some people are going to listen to this and not always agree, and that's okay. We're giving you our thoughts, and I think it's important to also realise that we recognise that money is important in those areas where it's important, and it's not all important in a lot of other areas of your life. So it's useful when it can solve those problems, when it can pay the school fees, when it can pay your bills, but uh, there are lots of other areas in your life, Tom. True wealth is more than just money, but we've spent a lot of time, effort, studying the wealthy and documenting it. And we've done that in our book, Rich Habits, Poor Habits, and that's become an international bestseller. And uh, you can get that on Kindle, on Amazon. You can listen to it in these our thoughts in these podcasts. But I'd be suggesting you go to richhabits.com and get your own copy of the book. You can get it from bookstores as well, but probably just as easy to go and get it on Amazon, Rich Habits poor habits, and it's been translated to lots of languages. The, the seventh myth I'd like to discuss with you, Tom, is the, the concept, that the thought that rich people lead extravagant lives. Is that true or is it a myth? So here's the interesting thing about wealthy people. About 99% of the wealthy are in this sort of bell curve. They have anywhere from uh, two to 7 million. That's the, that's the 99% of the wealthy in, in, in America and in, uh, probably in Australia. But the 1% that have, you know, that are DECA millionaires, Uber uh, millionaires, that maybe are even billionaires, they do have extravagant lifestyles because they can't, there's nothing they can do to spend their money. They know that. Uh, but when you're the average millionaire, it might be hard to spend all your money, but you can. So uh, they, you know, they were, they came from poverty. They came from the middle class. Uh, they have these lifestyle habits that they carry with them, just like Warren Buffett did. He lives in the same house he bought in 1955. He has these lifestyle habits that he picked up in his childhood, and he, he's not letting go of them. He likes those lifestyle habits. Uh, he doesn't need the exotic vacations. He doesn't need the yachts. He's happy. And a lot of wealthy people were just happy if they could have a vacation home or have once a year go on a really nice vacation with their family or do things for their family with the money that they had. They weren't really interested in supersizing their life. They, they just, you know, it cut them the wrong way uh, just to spend extravagantly. So they don't do it. Uh, it's just a matter of habit. So we're discussing seven money myths that you've uncovered th that aren't really true. But based on your findings, what practical advice would you give to somebody? Offer oh, somebody listening to this now who's aspiring to build wealth. Okay, those things aren't true. What can I do? They're probably thinking, what should I do? What habits, what mindset should I cultivate? Well, I think the first thing I would say, if, if you don't hate your job, if, if you at least like your job, I would ask you to sort of Devote yourself maybe a 30 minutes a day to becoming more expert 
in your career, in what you do, or in your industry. If you're one of these people that does hate their job, and uh, then I would say you need to experiment. You can do it on the side. You experiment with different skills. Every three months, try something new. Experiment until you find something that makes your heart sing. Uh, that's easier for you to do than somebody else. That's when you've you stumbled onto an innate talent. And I'll say this, Michael, if you are one of the three to six percent of the population that is in, has an innate talent that that they're mo- they've monetized in life, like a Tiger Woods or a LeBron James or a Roger Federer, you know, if you stumble onto an innate talent that you've perfected, uh, you're going to make a lot of money. But most people don't find their innate talent. And the reason is they don't experiment. They might get locked into playing football or soccer or, or basketball or tennis or some sport, and they don't experiment. They should be experimenting with a hundred different things between the ages of, you know, seven to 20 and in college, you know, just keep experimenting, never stop experimenting until you find that thing that really makes your heart sing because that that's nature's way life's way of ringing your doorbell and telling you, hey, you just found an innate talent. Uh, You need to to explore this and become good at it, and maybe you can make money doing it. Okay, let's finish off with one other thing that came up a couple of times in our discussion, the the role, the importance of persistence and resilience in developing wealth, Tom. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I I think that persistence and resilience is not such a matter of discipline or hard work ethic. I think it's driven by passion uh, for the dreams and the goals that you've identified and decided uh, I'm going to pursue in life. Now, when I remember when I got out of college, I I had this low self-esteem and I didn't think I had the ability to pass the CPA exam. But uh, I remember listening to an audio book by Brian Tracy, and he kind of cleared up some of the some of my limiting beliefs on that. And uh, I devoted a year and a half to studying for and taking the CPA exam, and I passed it. I did the same thing with the CFP exam. I did the same thing when I went for my master's. So I think when you're focused, you, when you're locked in to a goal, that you get this passion that, that fuels you. To, and it doesn't matter what happens, what obstacles occur, you're going to not let those obstacles or those problems stop you from continuing to pursue that dream or that goal. Well, as always, I love our chats, Tom. You give a lot of insight into this, and it comes from having studied the habits of the rich and the poor. I'll leave a link in the show notes to your daily blog that people should subscribe to just to get a level of inspiration. These are great thoughts and I look forward to catching up with you again soon for our next Rich Habits, Poor Habits podcast. Thanks for your time, Tom. Yeah, always enjoy our talks, Michael. Thank you very much. I love my chats with Tom. I hope you got some benefit from them. And if you did get something from today's show and you're not currently a subscriber to this podcast, just stop for a sec because in a moment I'm going to share my mindset message with you, but just stop for a sec and follow or subscribe to this show. Just click the button on your podcast app so that twice a week you're going to get information from a range of guests and from me about wealth, happiness, more money and success. And each week I share a mindset message with you because I think you recognize that If you change the way you think, you're going to change your outside world. But before I get to that, I also want to just talk a bit about property because we really didn't talk about property in this particular chat with Tom. But if you're trying to grow your wealth, if you're keen to grow your wealth, if you're wanting to take advantage of the new property cycle that's um, upon us, why not have a chat with my team at Metropole? We're more than just ordinary buyers agents. We help our clients safely grow and protect their wealth and outperform the averages because we use time-tested formulas, strategies I've fine-tuned over five decades and we've been helping our clients with for well over 20 years. In fact, only a couple of weeks ago, we were awarded again as Australia's leading property and wealth advisors 
by Finance Derivatives Magazine, an international magazine. Interesting, yeah, that's the third international award. Hey, it's not one of those we pay for, by the way. There's all those awards you can get, or you can get followers. That's not the way Metropole works. We've built a reputation of helping our clients outperform their averages, so we help them fix any problems they've got with their portfolio, we help them prevent problems moving forward, and we also help them safely outgrow the market we shift the odds in their favour. So we're big enough to shift the odds in their favour, but still small enough to give you the advice you need. And as I said, we're much more than buyers agents. We start by putting together a strategic plan, and then we actually help you, if you want to use our buyers agent services, we're a wealth advisory, property management, renovations, development. We've got a range of services to help you. Metropole.com.au Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In today's Mindset Moment, I'd like to share with you a story from one of my mentors, Jim Rowan. And Jim Rowan was a great storyteller. And he often mentioned the concept that over the years, he had been teaching children about a simple but powerful concept, the ant philosophy. Jim Rowan said he thought Everybody should study ants because they've got an amazing four-part philosophy. Now, here's the first part of the ant philosophy. They never quit. Now, that's a good philosophy. If they're headed somewhere and you try and stop them, they'll look for another way. They'll climb over. They'll climb under. They'll climb around. They'll keep looking for another way. What a neat philosophy to never quit looking for another way to get where you're supposed to go. Now, the second part of the ants' philosophy, according to Jim Rohn, was that they think winter all summer. Now, that's an important perspective. You can't be so na- naive to think summer is going to last forever. So ants are gathering their winter food in the middle of summer. An ancient story says, don't build your house on sand in the summer. Why do you need this advice? Because it's important to be realistic. In the summer, you've got to think storm. You've got to think rocks as you enjoy the sand and the sun. Think ahead. Now, the third part of that philosophy is that ants think summer or winter. Now, that's important. During the winter, ants remind themselves, this won't last long. We'll soon be out of here. And on the first warm day, ants are out. And as it turns cold again, they'll dive back down. But then they come out on the first warm day, and they can't wait to get out. Now, here's the fourth part of the ant philosophy, according to Jim Rowan. How much will an ant gather during the summer to prepare for the winter? All he possibly can. What an incredible philosophy, the all-you-possibly-can philosophy. Now, that's a great seminar to attend, isn't it? The ant seminar. Never give up, look ahead, stay positive, and do all you can. Thanks for that great lesson, Jim Ryan. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me, and I hope you got some benefit from this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it, or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour, and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. 
Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? 